I'm glad to be one of the redeemed, aren't you? If I, let's try that again. I said, I'm glad to be one of the redeemed, aren't you? Yes. If I could sing, if I could sing, I'd sing it exactly like that. And someday I will sing. And you will sing. Did you know that the Lord's preparing a great choir? You think the angel choir is something. They can't sing what we're going to sing. No, there's a grand choir that the Lord is preparing, and we'll all gather around the throne very soon. And what will we sing? Well, let's open the Bible and find out. Would you turn in the Word of God to the revelation of Jesus Christ, and we'll pick up right where we left off. In Revelation chapter 4, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice, which I heard, was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be Hereafter, All right, Lord, tell us what's coming after all of this. Well, John testifies in verse 2 and says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. He that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Would you pause just a moment? In the last two days, I've seen two of the most beautiful rainbows I've ever seen. I was home for a couple days between meetings, and we had, like you've been having, rain and sun, rain and sun, rain and sun. And uh, the other night, out in the country where we live, in the hills of West Virginia, the most beautiful, complete rainbow. And I stood there looking at it, just kind of in, in awe of the beauty of it, and then it dawned on me. That every one of those rainbows in the sky is a reminder of the greatness and the goodness of our God, of His promise. Early yesterday morning, I left my home and drove out to the little airport that I fly out of and parked my car and started to walk in and looked up and there, behold, in the sky again, another rainbow. When I come to Revelation chapter 4, I see a rainbow unlike anything you've ever seen before. May I say to you, all the rainbows lead to the throne. It's awful that the world has hijacked the rainbow to be a symbol of something so debauched and wicked and vile when our God has made it a symbol of something so pure and holy and wonderful. No, my friend, if you follow God's rainbow, it doesn't end to darkness. It always ends to light. It brings you to the throne. Verse 4, And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Revelation is an amazing book because it is not written in chronological order. That's, that's the way we think, you know. We, we think step by step by step. There is a certain chronology to it, and I'll talk to you more about that in a moment. But really, Revelation is written thematically. In other words, instead of it being chronological, it's contrasting. He He shows you heaven, and then He shows you earth. He shows you what's going on in eternity, and He shows you the here and now. All of us in this multimedia generation can understand if I say something is a split screen. I remember as a boy when my dad for the first time bought a television that had what they called at the time picture in picture. How many of you remember picture in picture? And he got that little tiny picture down in the, in the bottom corner. You could barely make out what the human beings were on it. But it was fascinating because theoretically you could watch two things at the same time. And now, now with our technology, you can have many screens all together and many people in many different places all on the same screen. Well, Revelation gives us, if I may say it this way, a split screen between heaven and earth. I've been pondering this week. I wonder why I wonder why the Lord keeps cutting away from earth and back to heaven and cutting away from earth and back to heaven. And it dawned on me that, listen to me, friends, if all you have your eye on is earth, you're going to be in despair. But if you can remember that there is a God that is above all and greater than all, then there's hope in that. And so back and forth, back and forth, we move from heaven to earth and earth to heaven. When Revelation 4 begins, the church is in heaven. In fact, that's the church in verse number 4, these 24 elders. They're clothed in white raiment. Aren't you glad someday the Lord's going to take us and He's going to give us new bodies and He's going to give us white raiment and we're going to be with the Lord Jesus forever. And the Bible says that they have on their heads crowns of gold. We'll come back to that thought in just a moment. But you'll remember that the judgment seat of Christ is the place where rewards are given. And I think there's a beautiful order here. 
because we've moved now from the catching away of the church to we're in heaven and we have the crowns. Oh, but we're not going to sit on the thrones long and we're not going to wear the crowns long. Skip over to verse number 10. In the midst of all this, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You're not going to get crowns so you can prance all over heaven and say, Hey, look at my crown. No, no, you're going to get crowns, rewards for your labors here. But you're not worthy of the crown. There's only one worthy of the crown. We all know who it is. His name is Jesus. If it wasn't for Jesus, we'd all be in hell now and we'd be separated from God for eternity. But the Lamb is worthy of the crowns. And one little interesting note, when you come to the end of Revelation and the Lord comes back and we'll come to that passage tomorrow night, I I challenge you to find it for yourself. When he comes riding on that horse out of glory back to earth, the Bible says that he has on his head, I love this, many crowns. Where did the many crowns come from? Because we've already taken all of our crowns and offered them back to the worthy name of Jesus Christ. When you come to Revelation 5, the emotion changes. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man, would you mark that in your Bible? No man. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. No man can substitute for the God-man. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much. They're rejoicing in chapter 4. They're weeping in chapter 5. I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. What was that book? You know, God's got a lot of books in his library. We're studying out of one of God's great books tonight. Aren't you glad we have God's book here? It's really a library of 66 books. It's an amazing book. It's the God-breathed book, the Bible, but the Lord has lots of books. There's the book of life where the names are found of all those who have believed on Christ. I hope your name is there. There are books where God keeps records of all that is done here, and we'll meet God with all of that someday. But this book is a unique book. The book in Revelation 5, if I may say it this way, is the title deed of earth. Who holds the deed? Well, I would ask you to go back to the end of chapter 4 and tell me, please, who created it all? He created every bit of it. When you come to Revelation 5, oh, this is powerful. The creator is getting ready to grab that title deed and take possession again of the world that he created to start with. How many of you know the earth's in a mess right now? Have you watched the news lately? War and chaos, yet another shooting today. I mean, every day you live, it's just like more bad news and more bad news and more bad news. And let me tell you the really bad news. The really bad news is it's not going to get better. People say, well, I tell you, I'm just hoping things get better. Well, read your Bible because it's not going to get better. I got some even better news, though. Though this world's not going to get better, Jesus is going to make all things new someday. See, the Creator is the one who makes a new creation. And he promised he'd make all things new. So when you come to Revelation chapter 5, oh, I love this. They're, they're saying, who's worthy to open this book? Who's, who's worthy to open these seals? Who's worthy to take possession of this? And John said, there's nobody. There's nobody. And then verse number 5, one of the elders saith unto me, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Do you see the thrice holy God yet again? You see God the Father on his throne. You see the Spirit of God, and you see the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he's the lion in verse 5, and he's the lamb in verse 6. There, there are four beasts, but there's only one lamb, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus steps forward and takes that title deed. Verse 7, he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb 
having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. How many saved people are here tonight? Would you raise your hand toward heaven? I want you to know you are in this passage. This is the redeemed choir. Would you like to join the redemption choir? You say, I'm not a very good singer. Well, if you've been saved, he's going to give you a new song. And all the angels are going to have to step to the side, and they're just going to stand in awe as a bunch of, as a bunch of wicked sinners stand up who now have on white garments, and they stand and say, we are the redeemed, and we'd just like to sing a verse to the one who redeemed us. Oh, what a worship service awaits us on the other side around the throne. Look at verse 11. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. I like it. Look, one mark, Pastor, you were talking about singing a minute ago. One mark of real revival in a church, people sing differently. I can't explain this to you, but when people get revived, it's like God opens them up. Sin closes you up. God opens you up. And when people get really right with God, no, no song leader has to pump and prime and say, come on, church, let's sing now. We can do better than that. No, they just open up and let her fly. They, they may not be the best singers, but they've got a great joy in their heart, and it comes out. And did you know that kind of thing is contagious? Enthusiasm, it's like the measles. It rubs off on you. And so in Revelation 5, the church starts singing, and finally the angels say, we can't take it any longer. We've got to join the choir. And all the saints that are gathered around start singing. And what do they sing? Look at verse 12. With a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And I want to stop and say amen to every bit of that. Jesus is worthy of it all. Verse 13, and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And then you come to chapter 6. And just that quick. We're back on earth. Do you see God's split screen? Heaven and earth. One sight, a glad sight. The other sight, a sad sight. We've come to the section of Revelation that explains to us the tribulation age. Now, frankly, there are tribulations in this world today. Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Anybody in here have a perfect life? I'm just curious. Any perfect life people here tonight? No, no. We, we live in a world of tribulation. We're imperfect people surrounded by other imperfect people with imperfect circumstances. I mean, just look, join the club, get in line, take a number. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. So there's lots of tribulation. But there is a definite tribulation with a capital T that is coming at the end of this church age that is known as the tribulation age and it is unlike anything this world has ever known. Let, may I say it this way? You think it's bad now. You haven't seen anything yet. In fact, all of hell's power and all of heaven's wrath is going to be unleashed on our planet for seven years. I've tried to imagine, I've tried to imagine what they will say on CNN during those seven years. I really have. I've tried to wrap my mind around what the reporters will say as they report on what we're about to see in Revelation. Tonight, I give you not one word but two. Would you please forgive me? Remember I said it was a split screen. Let's review just a moment. When we started the day, everybody get your hand out. Let's see if you remember. When we started the day, Revelation 1, 2, and 3, I gave you a word to write down. Anybody remember the word, church? What was it? Ready. God's people must be ready, and we're all getting ready to meet God. And then, Revelation chapter 4, in the first couple of verses this morning, I gave you a second word to write down. What was the word, church? Rapture, the catching away. So we're getting ready, and then the Lord's going to rapture the church. Tonight, I give you these two words. Would you write them down, please? I want you to write down rejoicing 
and rebellion. You talk about two extremes. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what's going to happen for seven years. In heaven, rejoicing, and on earth, rebellion. The age that we refer to as the tribulation age here on earth simultaneously will have an age of celebration around the throne. I wonder, which one do you plan to be at? See, everybody in this room, everybody in this room, if the Lord came right now, boom, would be one of two places. Either you're going to be with Jesus and you're going to be with Him during this terrible time of judgment. You're going to be with the Lord, and I'll show you that rejoicing in just a moment. Or, God forbid, you'd be left behind. And I just want to tell you tonight, as I'm standing here, as much as I'm rejoicing in my spirit, and there's a great comfort to me knowing that the Lord is going to deliver us and that God's going to make all things right and eventually all things new, as much comfort as I have in that, I am under such conviction tonight. As I'm speaking to you, thinking about the multitudes of people that I walk past every day who are not ready for the return of the Lord Jesus. As surely, as surely as God's people must cheer in the, in the goodness of God, God's people should also have a tear for the lostness of humanity around us. I must tell you that in the midst of the rejoicing, there's a great soberness in all of this because God is giving us a glimpse of what is getting ready to happen in this world. And I want you to know, it affects every one of us. It affects your family and your friends and your schoolmates and your ball team members and your neighbors and your co-workers and strangers at the gas station and grocery store. The whole world will be affected by this seven-year period. What do we learn about it? Well, let's start right where God does in Revelation chapter 5. First, would you write down, we see the church. What do we see the church doing? The church is rejoicing with the Lamb. I've marked this in my Bible. Would you mark in verse 6, a Lamb? And in verse 8, the Lamb? And in verse 12, the Lamb? And in verse 13, the Lamb? He could use any title or any name for our Lord Jesus Christ, but he brings us back to his Redeemer name, to his sacrifice name. He is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And at the end of the world, the only thing that will matter is this. Have you had your sins washed in the blood of the lamb? And if you have, then you can rejoice. In Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5, we get a little glimpse of what it's going to look like. For example, in Revelation chapter 4, we're coming to the judgment seat. That's where the crowns are given, and that's where we give the crowns back to him. Paul mentioned the judgment seat of Christ. He wrote to the church at Corinth, and he said that someday there's going to be a day that will declare everything we've ever, ever done as either being eternal or being temporal. It's either going to burn up or it's going to last. And he said this, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's every believer. And that's not to determine whether you're saved or not. Praise God, that got settled at the cross. But it is rather a place where we give an account to God for what we've done with the opportunity and with the ability that God gave us. And I'm, whew, I'm trembling as I stand before you tonight to think I'm going to answer to God. I'm going to answer to God for this message. I'm going to answer to God for my motives. I'm going to answer to God for every word that came out of my mouth. I'm going to answer to God for my reactions to people and the spirit in which I did the labor. Look. God keeps much better records than the rest of us do. And I want to say, some of God's people need to start thinking more about meeting God at the judgment seat of Christ. And certainly there will be reward there, but there will also be loss of reward. Have you ever wondered why there's no detailed explanation of the judgment seat of Christ? There is a very detailed explanation of the great white throne judgment in Revelation. That's the judgment of lost men. There's, there's a description of the judgment of the nations. But there is not a detailed step-by-step -step, uh, description and picture of what happens at the judgment seat of Christ. Have you ever wondered why that is? I'm going to tell you what I think. I think there's no detailed explanation of it because, look please, it will be extremely personal and it will be a situation where it won't be you and everybody else. It will be you and the Lamb. When I was a kid, I had in my mind that God had assigned an angel to me. 
And that angel had a video camera, and he followed me around everywhere I went, videotaped every bad thing I'd ever done. And when I got to heaven, you know, that giant screen was going to fall out of heaven, and the Lord was going to replay on that screen every bad thing I'd ever done, and I was going to be terribly humiliated. And some of you are chuckling right now because you thought the very same thing, didn't you? And then I started studying my Bible, and I found out that's not true. It's much worse than that. On the day you meet God, it won't be you standing collectively as a group. It will be you standing face to face with the creator God of the universe and knowing that he knows everything. Must I go and empty handed? Must I meet my Savior so? Not one soul with which to greet him. Must I empty handed go? I fear. Oh, I don't fear for my soul, but I'll tell you what I do fear. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. I do fear that I could give my whole life and I could be very busy and I could even be in the ministry and preach sermons. And somebody could say, now that fella, he's really getting after it. I could do all of that and someday all of that would just disappear at the judgment seat of Christ and none of it would count for anything eternal because it had not been done for the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing that's going to happen when we get with the Lord is we're going to meet him in judgment. And then when you move from Revelation 4 to Revelation 5, you move from the judgment seat to the worship service. I like that, don't you? And we just read through chapter 5 what a worship service it will be. Because watch this, please. The judgment seat of Christ is not going to make you think more of you. The judgment seat of Christ is going to make you think much more of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're all going to stand in awe of who the Lord is. Matter of fact, would you hold your place here? We'll come back in just a moment. Turn over to Revelation chapter 19. If you'd like to know where I'm going tomorrow night, I would challenge you to read Revelation 19 in its entirety and uh, do that tonight or do that tomorrow. But look at the beginning of Revelation 19 because this is the same time period. Remember, remember, we're back and forth from heaven to earth and earth to heaven. When you come to Revelation 19 verse 1, we read this, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. Would you mark that? In heaven. Because from chapter 6 to chapter 18, there's no mention of the church, and it's a description of the tribulation age here on the earth. And then just like that, the Lord switches back to heaven and says, here's what's going on in glory while, while it's all breaking loose down here. What are they saying? Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said... Hallelujah. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen. Hallelujah. That's the church's song. Say those two words with me, would you please? Amen. Hallelujah. No, you can do better than that. Ready? Amen. Hallelujah. One more time. Amen. Hallelujah. We're just, we're practicing. We're having a little choir practice tonight, all right? Because shortly this is what we'll sing around the throne and look, please, at verse number 5. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Would you do something? I want you to circle in verse 1 the word, Hallelujah. And in verse 3, hallelujah. And in verse 4, hallelujah. And in verse 6, hallelujah. Did you know this is the only chapter in the New Testament that has that word in it? And it's found four times. It is the same word as the Old Testament word, hallelujah. It literally means praise the Lord. Look at it. In verse 1, we praise God for his goodness. In verse 3, we praise him for his judgments. In verse 4, we praise him for his rule. In verse 6, we praise him for his power. But friends, we are going to praise him. And then the worship service moves to the dining room table. And I just want to tell you, you've never seen a table spread like this table before. Watch, please. The bride is the church. We've been called away. That's the rapture. We've received the beautiful wedding gifts there, the judgment seat of Christ, the wonderful rewards. And now we're called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm going back in my mind now, 25 years. And Tammy and I got married. We got married on Friday the 13th, Pastor. It was the luckiest Friday the 13th of my life. 
And I still remember that back door opening up and my bride coming down the aisle. It was wonderful. And I remember the meal that we had with everybody afterwards and what a celebration. But I want you to know, you've never seen a wedding that was perfect in your life. Maybe you thought it was perfect, but no wedding is perfect. But this wedding is going to be perfect because the bride has made herself ready and the Lord has wedding garments for us. Look, please. And on the day that Christ and His church get united for all eternity, it's going to be quite a celebration. Hallelujah is a good response. And notice what the Bible says in verse 7, let us be glad and, what's that word, church? Rejoice. Remember, I said to you, there is rejoicing and rebellion. In heaven, there is rejoicing. And give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen and clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. You know, this is really interesting to me. We know Christ is the bridegroom, and the church is the bride, and the Father is the host, and the Old Testament saints are the guest, and it's going to be quite a celebration. But did you ever notice and that contrary to the way we think today, the emphasis is not so much on the bride as it is on the bridegroom. Look at it. It's not the marriage of the bride. It's the marriage supper of the lamb. They play that beautiful music and somebody says, oh, oh, here comes the what? Right. Back in January, our oldest daughter got married. Did you know I prayed for the rapture to come before that day and God did not answer my prayer? And that fellow that married her, he said, I'm praying against you. <laughs> I guess he knows how to get his prayers answered because they got married. when She was a beautiful bride, and I'm thinking now in my mind about her. As we walked down that aisle together, and all eyes were on the bride. May I tell you, when we come to this marriage, all eyes won't be on the bride. Here comes the groom. Look at him with nail-pierced hands and feet. Scars on his forehead. But he made a way so we could be there. What a great Savior we have. He takes us to be with him and he rewards us and then he celebrates with us. And friend, nobody spreads a table like Jesus spreads a table. Look at verse 9. He saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. I say to you, on one hand, there will be great rejoicing of the church because at that moment we will come to the throne and then we will come to the table and ultimately we are coming to the Lamb of God that has taken away our sins. Now go back with me to chapter 6 and verse 1 and notice that there's not only rejoicing, there is rebellion. How could that be? Notice how the chapter begins, Revelation 6 verse 1, and I saw when, what's it say please? The Lamb. Did you ever notice, you know, everybody wants to talk about the Antichrist, the Antichrist, the Antichrist. Let me just tell you, the Antichrist is nothing and Christ is everything. Somebody even said about the tribulation, oh, the Antichrist is just going to have his way. Let me just point out to you that the tribulation is, age is not set in motion by what the Antichrist thinks he can do. It is set in motion by the plan and purpose of the Lamb of God. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And this sets in motion. Would you write this down, number two? Number one was the church rejoicing. Number two is the world rebelling. It sets in motion seven years of ever-increasing rebellion against God. If you think sin is bad now, you wait till the salt and light's gone. Can you imagine what this world would be like without the church? Can you imagine what this world's going to be like when the restrainer is removed? That's what Paul said to the church at Thessalonica. Look, it's like something is holding back the flood tide of iniquity. Yeah, it's called the Holy Ghost of God. And now I want you to imagine God says, all right, you don't want me. You want your own way. I'm going to give you what you want. And God lets the dam loose. And wave after wave after wave of judgment comes on this planet. In fact, there are three distinct waves of judgment. Here's the first. They're called the seal judgments. You might even want to mark them, number them in your Bible. 
They start in verse number 2 with a white horse. You heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse? That's where it comes from right here, Revelation chapter 6. In verse 2, you got the white horse. Somebody says, oh, a white horse, he must be the hero. Yep, that's what the world's going to think. He's coming on a white horse, but look at him carefully because this is not the Son of God. This is the Antichrist who comes making peace with everybody and saying good words. And by the way, when I was a boy and heard people preach about prophecy, I used to think, I don't know how that could ever be. How many of you have noticed in the last year or two, lots of things are happening many things are making a lot more sense isn't it amazing how overnight one person can be the hero of the world and don't you know a world sick of war fed up with conflict somebody's going to step on the stage and say I have a solution and everybody's going to say good we've been waiting on you to get here for a while you know what that is that's the first level of judgment for the record I'm not looking for the antichrist I'm looking for Christ because the rapture precedes this rebellion keep reading in verse 4, there's a red horse. What's that? That's war and bloodshed. In verse number 5, there's a black horse. You can read it for yourself. It's famine. People are going to start starving to death. In verse 8, there's a pale horse. And, and death and hell follows with him. What is that? It is death all over the planet. Keep reading. In verse number 9, there's a, there's a fifth part of this, of this seal judgment. It's persecution. People being slain, put to death. In verse 12, there is a great earthquake and the sun becomes black and the moon becomes like blood and the stars of heaven start falling out of the sky. What is this? Disaster and disruption and despair on earth. Natural disasters everywhere. And oh, I shudder to think about this. As awful as it is, what I just described to you, the seven seals, every seal broken and every seal revealing another judgment. Watch please. This is not the end of the wrath of God. This is but the beginning of the wrath of God. I'm going to tell you what's wrong with this planet right now. There is no fear of God in our world anymore. I'm going to tell you why we haven't had revival and a great turning to God. People laugh at things that they used to weep over. And even some of God's people have lost the fear of God. I'll tell you what we need. We need a fresh vision of a high, holy God seated on the throne of the universe, the judge of all the earth that will do right someday. Dear God, help us get a glimpse of the wrath of God again. And so he begins with the seven seal judgments. You have to come to chapter 8, verse 1 to see the seventh one. It's kind of strange, really, but the seventh seal judgment is silence. Somebody says, that sounds nice. No, no, this is eerie silence. You ever been in the eye of a storm? When you know there's a little calm, but it seems like there's more coming. That's, that's the silence here. And by the way, in that silence, people are praying. And I love this. In the silence, when people pray, God hears and answers their prayers. And it's the prayer of saints that sets in motion the next phase of the judgment of Almighty God. And so come to chapter number 8 and walk with me through the next phase of judgment. The first was the seven seal judgments. Now you got the seven trumpet judgments. Isn't that interesting? Everybody remember trumpets earlier today? And, and, man, when we hear the trumpet of God, somebody said, Hallelujah, we're out of here. Watch this. The trumpet is a sound of joy for God's children, but fear for those who do not know God. It all depends on which side of the army you're on. Look at the trumpets. In verse 7, the first trumpet sounds, what is it? It's disaster on earth, hail and fire and blood. In verse 8, there's a second trumpet. It's disasters in the sea. In verse 10, there's a third trumpet. It's disaster in all the water. Even the fresh water gets poisoned. In the 12th verse, the fourth trumpet, there's disasters in the sky. One third of the, the sun and the moon and the stars gets knocked out. Somebody says, what does that look like? I don't know. We've never seen anything like that before. Imagine the fear that's going to grip the hearts of people. If that were not enough, when you come to the end of the chapter, he said, that's, that's just the first four. There's three left. He says, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's about to get worse. And here they are in chapter 9 and verse 1. The fifth trumpet sounds, the fifth angel. What is it? It's demons unleashed on the earth. Somebody said, you really believe in demons? I want you to know that Satan and all the hounds of hell would love to have their way with this planet at this moment. But God is greater than all of them. There's coming a moment that the Lord's going to say, fine, you want hell's way, you want Satan's way, and God is going to allow all of hell to be opened up and the demons to have their way on this planet. You talk about vileness and wickedness. It's coming. 
In verse 13, the sixth angel sounds his trumpet. And what is it? Angels come out making war. You can read these verses for yourself, but one-third of humanity is put to death. I want you to ponder that just a moment. Imagine one-third of all human beings die. If you run the numbers, you mathematicians, in verse 15 and in verse 16, it's 200 million people making war for 13 months and a day. I want you to imagine how much death and destruction there would be if 200, 200 million people were fighting for 13 months and a day. You know what this is? God says, all right, I'm just going to let you have your way. You know, it's kind of like the prodigal. The more he got what he wanted, the less he wanted what he got. And then flip over a couple pages because here's the seventh one. In chapter 11 and verse number 15, the seventh trumpet sounds. And what is it? There's a declaration that Christ is king of all. It's interesting. The last of each of these judgments is almost like a, a pause, a reflection on the judgments. And so in the sealed judgments, it's silence. In the, in the trumpet judgments, it's a declaration that Christ is king. Hey, logically, logically. And by the way, sin is not logical. But logically, wouldn't you think after this much judgment, people would be saying, saying Christ is king. Don't you think they would acknowledge that? I'll tell you how hard the heart of man is. Look at verse number 18. And the nations were angry. And thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. They literally, look please, shake their fist in the face of the judge, and they're angry at the one who is pouring out the wrath, but it all started with their rejection of Jesus Christ. And then turn over a couple pages more and come to Revelation 16 because here's the third wave of judgment. You had the seven seals and then the seven trumpets and now the seven vials or bowls. Revelation 16 verse 1, pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. It would be, it would be like me saying, look please, you see this cup of water and it is filled up and if I started pouring it out, and I didn't just pour it out a little bit, I poured out every bit of it. Look, please, there's coming a day that every drop of the wrath of God is going to be poured out on this planet. And friend, I'm going to tell you, you don't want to be here, and you don't want those you love to be here. Here are the bold judgments. Look at verse 2. They just come, boom, 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 one right after another. In verse 2, the first one is sores and boils on the human body. In verse 3, the second comes, the sea gets turned to blood. That means all the fish die. Imagine how much death there would be in the oceans of the world. And then in verse 4, the third, all the fresh water gets turned to blood. Sounds a lot like the plagues in Egypt, doesn't it? Comes full circle back to a world that's hardened its heart towards Almighty God. What does that mean? It means there's no drinking water. Imagine people now cannot find water to drink. Look at verse 8. The fourth, the sun starts burning men. Do you understand that if the sun was a little further away from our planet, we'd freeze to death and look closer to us, we would burn up, and God's going to make just a slight adjustment in all of it, and the sun is going to begin to scorch men. In verse 10, the fifth one is that God's going to pour out his wrath on the government of the Antichrist. The guy who promised peace and has been ruling the world, God's going to start overruling all of that. And it's going to get so bad, people are going to gnaw their tongues for pain and blaspheme the God of heaven and in verse 12, the sixth trumpet, or the sixth vile judgment is that God's going to drop the Euphrates River. And somebody says, big deal, man, with everything else going on. Oh, it is a big deal. Because this particular region of the world is where the biggest battle in the history of the world is ever going to be fought, the Battle of Armageddon. Everybody heard of Armageddon? Do you know the river Euphrates has to be a dry riverbed for the armies that God has prophesied to cross that riverbed to come to the place, the valley of Megiddo, where the great battle will be fought. And God is going to orchestrate and take care of all of it. Why? Because he rules the good and he overrules the evil. Look, please, this world is not in the devil's hands. This world is in the hand of the one who holds the title deed to it. And then look at verse number 17. The seventh angel pours out his bowl, his vial, and there's a worldwide earthquake unlike anything you've ever seen. Look at verse 21. There's so many natural disasters, but look at verse 21. There fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. You ever seen hail? Really bad hail? Let me show you how bad this is. Every stone about the weight of a talent. Hold on to your seat. You know how much that is? That's 100 pounds each. I want you to ponder 100-pound blocks of ice falling out of the sky. Look at it. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Look at me. Wave after wave 
after wave of judgment coming on this planet. In the seal of judgments, man has his way. Sin always gets worse and never gets better. And God's just going to let man have his way. And then the trumpets begin to sound. And what is this? Satan's going to have his way. All the demons will be let loose. And the devil in darkness is going to ravage this planet. But oh, watch this. Please don't miss this. In the last series of judgments, the vile judgments, God's going to have his way. May I tell you in the end, God always has the last word. May I just pause and testify for a moment? This is the kind of thing you really don't enjoy preaching. Like last week, I preached through a bunch of psalms, and boy, they were really nice. And I prayed towards this meeting, and the Lord said to me, this is what you're supposed to preach. And said, look, I'm just obeying the one I work for. You'll have to take it up with him if you don't like it. But I want you to know something. As surely as we're going to be rejoicing around the throne here on earth, they're going to be rebelling against God. God is going to be pouring out his wrath on this planet. You know, I think it's really important right now for people watching the news and looking at world events and wondering about the future to be reminded that eternity is just over the next horizon. That around the next bend, look, I don't know. I have no idea what Wall Street's going to do tomorrow. I couldn't tell you what Washington's going to do this week. I have no idea what the pandemic's going to do. I have no idea what the world armies are going to do. But I know this, Jesus Christ is coming soon. And the only thing that matters is that we get ready and we help others get ready. And as I read and meditate on all of this and Ponder the great contrast, God's split screen of the rejoicing and the rebelling. I want to tell you what I want. Look, please. I want to get as close to God as I possibly can, and I want to get the gospel to as many people as possible while I still have a chance. Let me end with one last picture. Would you, would you turn over to Revelation 18? We'll, we'll come back to Revelation 19 tomorrow night, so let's leave off here. Look at Revelation 18 because this is the end of the tribulation period. When it all shakes out, when all the judgments have been unleashed. Look at Revelation 18, verse 19. This is, this is what's going to happen on this planet. They're going to cast dust on their heads and cry, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour she is made desolate. It's a little picture of the economic situation. Listen to me. I don't know what the recession is going to do. I have no idea what the economy is going to do. And all of us have our concerns about that. But I want you just to be reminded of something. Stuff is all going to burn up someday. And if you're living for things and money and material gain, you're going to be very empty-handed when you kneel at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Because on that day, it, it's not going to matter how big your house is, how new your car is, how many clothes were in the closet or money in the bank account, how many weeks vacation you got. None of that's going to matter when we see Jesus. And then look at verse 20. Rejoice over her, thou heaven. And ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. Would you write somewhere that verse 19 is the rebelling on earth and verse 20 is the rejoicing in heaven? Could I just remind you that what you see on earth is not what's going on around the throne of God? And I know things are a mess right now, but everything's still all right in my Father's house, I'll tell you that. God is where He's always been, seated on the throne he has his eye on you, his ear open to your prayer. He has every hair on your head numbered. He knows your frame and remembers that you are dust. He holds you in the palm of his hand. Look, please. He knows his own and he knows what he is doing. And it is time for God's people to say, Lord, we want to be ready when you come. And we want to help others get ready too.